Yo, what's up? Podcast, what's good? Masters National Road Race in Albuquerque this year. You saw the videos. You know what's up. We are not even really going to talk about that. I want to talk about racing at altitude. So I want to talk about pre-race training. I want to talk about my run into the race and my taper because I've kind of fiddled with this a little bit. Every t- you know, it's so funny that as personalized as training gets, tapering always wants to get like this template and I w- it just can't work out that way like races especially if you're doing a bunch of races during the year just like you really gotta look at what you've been doing make sure you get the rest when you need rest I think the biggest mistake people do is the weeks don't align properly and then it ends up either they're training too much and they don't rest or they're like, ah, I'm just going to add on one more week and keep going and then do a race. Or it gets kind of cockeyed the other way and then they go into like a two-week taper and then they like haven't ridden and then they go to this big race and it's like they haven't trained in two weeks. So I think that's something to talk about. Talk about racing in the heat. Talk about the finish. I'll definitely address the finish. I got a couple things to say. And then the power and how to address a course like this. We're going to look at the race. I've broken this down. If you were into like Strava searching at all, this is the course. Now, it's only 60 miles, which I did not get a reply. But when I emailed the race promoter at USA Cycling, I said, hey, I am so thankful that there is a race. I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. Can we make this longer? This is sixty mile, a 60-mile road race. And I guess after I sent it, I was like, well, you know what? Masters races are shorter. I don't do a ton of Masters racing outside of nationals, so maybe I shouldn't have said anything. I never got a reply. But needless to say, here's the course. Let's chat about it real quick. It's obvious from this profile here. And how do I get this to just stick there? Um, Yeah, this could be a problem because we're going up to 7,200 feet. Flashback to 20. 19 do we have nationals no 2018 when we were in colorado springs that was a bad experience no that was a great experience for me i felt horrible even when we got to new mexico when we were at five fifty five hundred feet driving through i started to get a little sick feeling and i you know kept drinking water and i was like you know i was living in memphis then so going from zero feet to 5500 it starts to hit me. We get to Colorado Springs. I feel a little awkward. I went to do the time trial. So I was there many days before. Uh, excuse me. Not many. Maybe like two days before the time trial. A day before the time trial. Do the time trial day off in the road race. Just I came in fifth. I just couldn't go hard. It was. I remember doing like 450 watts and being like, I'm dying. This is bad. Now... Fast forward to the first time I came to Blowing Rock, uh, maybe the second time. I can't remember if we started looking for houses yet. I went to do a VO2 max workout, and looking back now, I was doing it probably at only 3,500 feet, maybe 3,300 feet. I couldn't put out the watts. I was doing like, I cracked. I tried to do five minutes at 480, and I like fell apart two minutes in. I was like, well, that was weird. Like, maybe this hill's too steep. Tried somewhere else, which is like, yeah, this, that doesn't make sense. Um, did like 450. I should go back and look at the numbers. It was sad. Tom and I were like, bad, bad workout, like onward. The next day I felt kind of crappy too. It didn't dawn on me until a week later. I was like, yo, dude, maybe I'm just like super baby sensitive to altitude. I'm at 3,500 feet. And then I didn't realize a lot of my rides, my local ride here goes up to 4,400. I just realized that today. So... Going from Blowing Rock to Albuquerque was going to be uh, much less of a change. Here was, and we can look at the Strava segment. I'm trying to think if I... Heartbreak, guardrail. This is the 0.42 miles. It's 289 feet of elevation. Average gradient is 12.9, but yeah, it hits you with like a 17one or. Kip Taylor was in our race, and he's got the KOM at 229. So I went, and I found an almost identical hill near me because the big thing was I'm thinking, 
okay, at elevation, if I'm going to have a hard time breathing, you know, this is going to be a two and a half max effort. How am I going to, you know, am I going to be able to put out the watts that I can put out here? Will the gear, will that change the gearing at all? I use uh, 3928 and around here, it's good enough. There's very rarely, um, if Stephen Young sends me on some crazy route, shout out Stephen. Thank you for all the routes you've been giving me. Um, he'll send me on some crazy steep stuff. And I'm like, damn it, I wish I had a 30 or, or just like a smaller baby upfront ring um, on like a kid's bike. But uh, I, I can get around. And I wasn't sure how that would play out. So I did this sim after the Boone Grand Fondo a couple times. I rode back and I, I smashed it up there. And I was like, okay, I'm making it up there on my own after riding like 100 and whatever miles. When I'm on race day and I'm chasing people because I know I won't be leading the pack up that thing, I should be good. The interesting thing, though, is that's this portion, okay? So, really, you start climbing. Let's see. Let, let me try not to confuse this thing. You know, we're coming down the road. You start climbing here. And then this, when you're coming northeast, and you can follow that dot there on the map, it doesn't, you're climbing, but it doesn't really feel as much like you're climbing because you can see the climb that you're about to turn on to. You turn on to the climb here, and it's like d nobody attacks because you know what's ahead. But like there's a little stair step, and we'll talk about this. I broke this down into the long climb. And then there's a short surge area, and then there's the short climb, which is like the two minute and forty five second effort. I think the we we rode up it pretty quickly the first time. I think put us in like fifteenth ish place for the KOM, um, and then we'll talk about the second one. So there's my little notes. So the gearing, I practice the hill near home. I always call it elevation instead of altitude. <laughs> it's rookie. Aerofit. I know people are like, oh my God, you got a commercial in here. When I knew this race was going to be at altitude, I got super strict with doing Aerofit because just like anything in training, you got to be consistent with it. And so I was doing the inhale strength and the depth. There is an elevation module, but I think the depth is better because it's helping you change your chemoreceptors, which are the things that are telling you when you're holding your breath, hey, little wuss, you need to breathe. You need air, and you really don't, and I'm very bad at that. I, I cannot hold my breath very well, so the other game plan was I decided not to do the TT because I still have that Garneau TT bike. Shout out DNA Racing. Thank you for that. Um, but it is old. It is very old. It it I, I need one of those like Gucci, the the big like the armrests are up. Yeah, those twelve thousand dollar bikes. I don't have one of those, and I really want one. But you know, I was supposedly a gravel racer. <laughs> um, but maybe I'll maybe I'll I'm trying to work out what I'm doing for bikes next year. But I would love to get back in the time trial. But here's my thing. I don't know if I can do a TT at elevation and then be good at the road race. And the road race is what I want. That is the number one goal for my racing life. I don't, I mean, people were like, why aren't you doing the crit? You're here. This, I do not say this is disrespect to the people that won the crit. I just don't care about it. it I don't know. Maybe I need to like re, maybe I need to go do some crits and like fall. I can't even say fall back in love with them. Um, maybe I'll do it next year. I don't know. Just I wanted to go ride. I also had my husband there. I didn't want – if I had the crit the, the day after the next day, then it's like you're racing, then you're waiting to race, and then you're racing, and it was going to be on Sunday night. And I was just like, if I don't race, I can ri wake up Saturday and ride, then go do stuff. We're going to go to Santa Fe. Then Sunday, I got all Sunday to do whatever I want. Um and so, yeah, no regrets in not doing it, but the road race is what I was there for. Maybe I'll change my mind on that. But so the reason with the time trial, 
my approach was this year, everyone says like, just show up and race. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to drive, cause I was going to go visit some friends in Oklahoma city, do a little bit of house sitting. I thought it'd be kind of cool. I've never driven out that way. I've never even been to New Mexico. So I stop in Oklahoma city and then I'm like, I'm going to leave. And I pit stopped in Santa Rosa, this super small town, not the best hotel options. I stayed at what the best one there. What was it? A Fairfield Inn or like a Hampton Inn, which is usually, it was clean, but it was less nice than the other ones that I've stayed at in less rural places. We'll put it that way. Super fun ride though. Like rode down through this canyon and like did some sprint openers and we'll talk about the run into the race. You know, it was one of those times in the race where, or getting ready for a race, man, shout out to roadie bikes here in blowing rock. We basically had to put on new shifters, new bars, which meant new bar tape, new brakes, new brake pads. They waxed my chain, although I'm not a wax chain fan. Thank you guys, but I'm not, not into that. And this all stemmed from like my bike gets used a lot. Okay. Maybe I'm going to start going to bike shops. I'm going to be going to roadies here. I'm going to be going to B and J's in Florida. And I'm going to be like every six weeks, like, yo, make this pretty. And they're going to find stuff because when they change the shifters, they're like, yo, dude, your shifter, the ring is digging into the carbon bar. You probably shouldn't ride these. So I'm on some like super wide backup bars that I got. Um, but hey, got to work with what you got. So I'm doing these sprint openers and the, the, it, the chain is like, so I'm riding through this canyon. So I'm like, 54 11 rolling and these sprints are super fun and it starts like popping and i'm like there's no way this cassette is toast i this is not that old of a cassette the chain's not that old i had actually just changed the chain in oklahoma so i'm like did i key the chain somehow i don't think so because i change these things religiously so i go over i like fiddle with the shifting make sure it's all lined up and i'm looking and i'm like damn it somehow a tooth got bent so I brought the 1130 cassette just in case because I was a little still paranoid about this climb. So I took the 11 off that, put it on, went back out, butter. So I'm like, okay, we're good to go. Had new cleats on, like just, I'm like, I'm feeling good. So the arrival date, stick to the plan. I'm going to roll in the day before. I'm going to do a quick ride. I actually wanted to roll in like the night of, but the race is on Friday. I'm talking to my husband, Chris. He's like, all right, dude, I'll see you on Wednesday. And I was like, you mean Thursday? And he's like, nope, I'm going to be in Albuquerque on Wednesday. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to get you a hotel room because I'm not going to be there till Thursday. He's like, oh, he's like, damn, how do we screw that up? I'm like, I don't know. And then I'm like, I can't like sit outside, like literally on the border of Albuquerque because I'm scared of another thousand feet of elevation and let this dude chill by himself in Albuquerque. No offense, ABQ, but there wasn't a lot popping. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going in Wednesday. I'm like, yo, dude, sorry. I've got to stick to this plan. I'm coming in Thursday. So I go on Thursday. I went and got my number. I don't know why for nationals. I always feel like I need to go get my number early. It's probably a waste of time. Um, all good. The week before, as we roll into training, I had done three pretty solid weeks and I felt really good. So, you know, what it was is go to nationals, amateur nationals, rest, train, 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 rest, go race. And so, you know, I don't even know if I probably talked about this in the other video for amateur nationals. So this can we can go all the way back into May. Went on Chris's birthday trip, went and got my face kicked in on Johnson City, which no excuses, but I want to highlight this for people. That when you come when you stop riding your bike, it is hard to freaking ride a bike long. I was like falling apart on this damn race and it was it was long. This is extra bonus miles. And I, please do not take this as an excuse. I would not have done any better in that race. But one thing that I found helped was get some long rides in before you have to rest for the race. It wasn't enough, but it was better than 
And I understand everybody doesn't have three or four hours during the week. Get in what you can. It's going to help you come around faster. That's why on the weekend, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but go to the race. Even if you know you're not going to be primo prime because you just rested, go race. It's going to help just activate everything. I know that sounds like it's probably like a hocus pocus bro term. But, man, you come out and then the next day I felt great. It was like uh, I'm back at it. Let's go. I went to Tonga, came in fourth and second. Didn't get the W, but I felt pretty good. Um, I've been hiking a bunch and then VO2 max. And I did a couple short threshold efforts before the race just to really like get back in the groove here. And then the last week was, did I, I'm surprised I lift. I haven't lifted in a long time. Um, that's for another video, but did some max hill efforts, did a couple long rides. Um, the over unders, which are like my new favorite workout of the year. So this is actually good. I was just talking about this. So I did one, two, three, and then we just kind of decided to stay sharp. Didn't really train, hit one, couple of days off, an easy ride. So this could be a good taper. I don't know. I felt pretty dang good. So this is why every case you can't make a template because this, do you know why I feel like this worked? Because I took four days off, five days off here. Just tried to stay active, but getting in one, two, three big weeks was better just to like, this is kind of a taper, something hard Tuesday. It would have been bad to rest and then ride, I think. But we'll talk about that. This is good. I didn't even realize it was going to be part of the video. We're just one take Tony. This is, we ad lib this stuff sometimes. We come back and we have one, two, three, four weeks till the big one. So I go to the road race and then I'm like, okay, rest week. This was a really good rest week for me. Two hikes, shorter endurance ride, then some like tempo, and then two long rides. This one helped make these possible. Um, Pretty big week for a uh, rest week, but I really, my focus is on these five days here. So I felt super good on these max hill efforts. And I could go back to the exact file, but I'm not going to. I did one, two, three, like three and a half hard efforts. Yeah, I was like a 20 minuter. That's right. Then I did lactate clearance over unders. I went after a KOM. I had two days off because I was moving some stuff here to Blowing Rock and then really solid VO2 max workout that gave me a ton of confidence. It felt really good in these hard starts. And we can actually, you know what, sometimes people email me, they're like, hey, I wish you would go back to that file. So I'm going to do that real quick. And if you don't like this, then you can just skim ahead and we will be back with you super shortly, very quickly. So on that day, yeah, I did a 19-minute effort at 4.33. Oh, this is when I was complaining about the car that came out in front of me. I think I can do 20 minutes for 4.50. I realize that's 17 more watts. I have never been doing these tests on hills like they have here in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it is not fair. You are able to really crank it. So I rode this like an over-under, and I actually I rode this road today. And I was thinking about that ride, and I was like, dude, I was rolling, man. These overs felt like nothing. Crushing. 450, man. I know Stephen Bassett's after that. My guy, Stephen Bassett, pro cyclist, super helpful human being. You know, he came on our podcast. He told me to get a frame bag. He's telling me to get a water filter. I mean, dude. Steve, if you ever become a dad, you're going to be killer. A lot of good tips. All right, so let's get off this one. Then we talked about that week. And then I went to Grand Fondo. This week was pretty fire. VO2 max, did some sprints. Tom calls them mitochondrial efficiency efforts. Fancy. I'm a little bit more uh, traditional. Road to Asheville. Big ride. 
100 miles, 10,000 feet of climbing, walked a lot, did the Grand Final National Championships, huge ride, super fun, rode home, didn't realize that it was going to be 14,000 feet of climbing because I did not map that one out. And I forgot that if you go point to point, it's not going to be the same as when you went and I started back and it was raining and I was like, this might be, this might be a seven hour day. It was a little short. I should have kept pedaling, but I was pretty tired by the end of that. So chilled, did a time trial. And at this point, when I am three weeks out, this is what I used to always say, and I kind of got away from this. Three weeks out, just freaking pour it on. And I'm going to say this with a warning. If you can handle this training, this is the time to freaking pour it on, dude. Four hours, four hours, five and a half, six, seven, five almost with a time trial in it. Definitely not a recovery ride. And then I recovered, and then I did a thing, and then a thing, and then I did Tonga 2. How did I do in that race? Did I come in second? I asked second. That dude from Cinch beat me. Uh, he rose. He crushed it all day. This kid is like 20, 18, 20, something. Just flying. But, okay, now we got two weeks. Let's get in a little bit more recovery zone. So this is how I did this one. And I think this is really good. I came off this rest week and felt really good. One, two, three, rest. And now this is where I'm talking about. Some people might be like, but dude, you're resting with this before. Well, let's just get the body reactivated. I want to recover from all of that, okay? And then let's get me just back into like I'm feeling good as if this Masters National Championship is going to be like a Thursday workout that I'm going to go crush. Like I think we overthink some of these big races. And – you know, I've had some people that will lay out the uh, like the run up to a race, and they get nervous, and they stop riding, or they make the two hour ride sixty minutes, or they make the they make the you know four hour ride two and a half hours. And it's like I'm not a scientist, but I keep hearing people talk about the plasma volume changes, and I know that your VO two max declines very rapidly. After I know it's only after ten days, but dude, when you don't ride. You feel junky. So why would you do that before a big race? I know online, and I even, maybe I need to go back and look at, I have a taper out there that is like conservative because less is more. Because I know the other flip, the other side of this coin is some people get nervous about when they're tapering and then they start trying to like cram and do everything. So I think in my sort of like, hey, here's a taper that you could use. It's hard here, hard here half of your event, long ride or like three hours. And then it's race or intervals. Let's say for this one, it would be race or intervals. Um, let me do this backwards. Openers, day off, openers, hard ride. Sometimes that three days is too much. I, I, and, you know, I'm, I, this is why templates suck. Straight up, templates suck. So this is what I did the, the week of. Um, four hour ride. I got out there in the heat in Oklahoma because baby, you know, it's going to be burning up in ABQ. Did some sprints, make sure all those anaerobic fibers are ready to just be ripping if it comes down to a sprint. And I actually was predicting that it was. And then I did just a regular openers ride, which was an hour and a half cruise. I actually don't even think that I did the harder efforts because I was just like, I'm good, which is dangerous. Sometimes I don't, I think some athletes go too much on field. Oh, I did one. I did one effort and I was like, okay, I'm rolling, dude. Oh, I did a, I did a, I went up the climb. I tried the climb. Forgot about that. Got on course, did the climb, rode longer than I wanted to, but I wanted to see the whole course and that was valuable. It was valuable to see the finished climb. So this video is long. Sorry, guys. You can skip ahead. Maybe I'll put some, some notes in here. I don't know where this chatty burst of energy came from, but I think there's a lot of good. I think this is good to talk about. I, I think a lot of this stuff gets left out and I really want to like, somebody said, Hey man, you don't seem to hide anything like, but can, can we pull the curtain back even more and like t tell me things that you don't put in a video? And then I was like, well, 
video should be 20 minutes. Like, nah, dude, I would watch a 45 minute race video. Cause if it's things that are going to help me prepare for my race, why wouldn't I want that? And so we'll see how this one goes. All right. So that's a week before pre-ride. I get a call from Owen shot or a message who says you need to pre-ride the end of the course. And I was like, why? He's like, so it's not on the course. You're going to turn off into a neighborhood. And then when you do that, you're going to, the the turn is like, you're going to be flying down this, this road. The turn is like, it's not over a little hump. And it's not, I don't want to say off camera because it's not that dramatic, but like, you're just, you're going to be going over 40. You're going to drop down into this neighborhood and then there's a little blip up, but you're going so fast, you're going to be going over 40 miles an hour and there's the finish line. And I'm like, so it's like sprint to that corner. And he's like, probably, he's like, it depends, you know, you like see what the group is like. And so he's like, I'm telling you though, dude, you need to ride this. He's like, if you don't, you will break on race day. So I'm like, all right. So I'd go do this lap. Uh, I saw Justin Lowe from Tennessee. Shout out, Justin. It's good to see you, man. Um, and I'm like, all right, man, I'll see you later. I'm going to go check out this finish. So I, like, pick up speed, and I'm coming down, and I go to take this left, and I'm like, whoa, brakes, 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 brakes. And I'm like, okay, this, why is this so – this is a funny turn. And it wasn't like – it's kind of like Albuquerque, like a little gritty road. It didn't feel super, like – you didn't feel like you were really sucked down to it. I was like, all right, I need to, like, go back and do this one more time. So I went back and I did it and I wasn't going super, super fast, but I was just like, you know what, man, you just got to be in the race and just freaking rip it on race day. Like you're thinking too much about this. So I'm looking down and on the road, uh, the thing, the first time I come down, there's all this broken pavement. Now, to be fair, some people have ridden over it. I went back after the race and looked at it. You could ride over it. But while my first initial ride down, I was like, oh, I'm definitely not riding over that. Note to self, go to the right of the white line because the road's going to curve to the right and fastest line to the finish and avoid that pavement. So got the game plan down. I text Craig and I'm like, do you see the broken pavement? He's like, definitely avoid that. I'm like, noted, talk to Owen. I'm like, dude, pavement. He's like, stay to the right of the white line. Check, copy. We're all on the same page. Let's do this. Let's go race. Get to the race. And I'm Chris is ready to do the feed zone with only two laps. You're going to be there at 45 minutes in and then like at an hour and a half, two laps. It's going to be over 90 degrees at 7,000 feet it is going to be hot. I'm bringing all my water. If you miss a feed, you, there, there's no time to catch up. So I decided the extra weight was going to be something I wanted. I had a nail gene bottle and I had 80 ounces of fluid on me. So um, I have not gone fully in on this. I, I haven't talked about it a ton. I've been using maple syrup and sea salt from Ted King um, from his advice. And I just use maple syrup, organic maple syrup from uh, Walmart, to be honest with you. And I put it in a flask. I put it in my bottles. I've gone back. I might try regular Malto and sea salt again, but I've tried other products that I used to love. They taste really chalky now, especially in the heat. Mix up my bottles. We get there. We get in the parking lot, turn off the car and instantly it starts getting hot. And I'm like, I look at Chris and the bike's out. I'm like already unpacked. I'm like, dude, I think we need ice. I think we need to do ice socks. And I luckily had three stockings in my bike bag. And he's like, you want to do it? I'm like, do you mind doing that? And he's like, no, nah, man, I'll do anything that I can do to help you. Husband, you are the best. And he's like, you sure you don't want me to do bottles? I'm like, no, nah, man, if we miss a bottle, like it seemed like it was going to be pretty fast out there. Like if we miss a bottle, it's it could that could be why I lose. But if we do ice, that'll be super easy to hand off. You just hold this big stocking. You can grab any part of the stocking and you got it. I'm like, let's do ice. And he's like, well, okay, we'll do it. And the parking lot's getting kind of full. He's like, well, I'm going to drive down there, but I want to go straight to the feed zone because it was kind of getting like they were being weird with letting people back in or something. So I'm like, well, you know what? Let me get dressed. I'm going to ride down. I'm going to get an ice sock to start and then I'll send you on your way. And he's like, okay. Last minute decisions. 
Let's go to the beat. Ice socks were key. Key, key, key. Now the race. Feels good to look back on this day. I will say that. 64 miles. Baby, it's all about coasting. It's all about conserving for that climb. And it's all about winning this freaking bike race. Um, it would be my third Masters National Championship if I could do it. The I think the best way that this will be a relatively quick run through of the race. You know, it's going to be here. It's going to be any any shenanigans that happen between the climbs. It's going to be the last climb. And then I was curious how these last three lumps would be played. And this is, excuse me, this last climb, you climb it, you turn right, you're going to be ripping down the road, and then we go into that neighborhood. So for the long climb, 11 minutes, 20 seconds at 7,000 feet, we normalize 417. Big surge at the bottom, super chill. This is a little stair step that people like – it was interesting to watch. Some people were like, I might hit it here a little bit. And I was like, I'm definitely not doing that because this climb is about to like be right there. And kind of, people were like, we're pretty delicate with it. Um, we chilled. And so the short surge wasn't much, but the short climb, 532 for 240. And at 7,000 feet, um, I was super pumped with that. Like I felt good. I was maybe five guys back. I was waiting to see if people were going to attack over the top. I really, I, I kept telling people that I thought this was going to be a sprint finish because that climb is so hard just to get over. Like you're in your easiest gear. Some people are just too big to do it. Luckily, I can put out a lot of watts. We lost the first time around. We lost half the field who did come back, but I didn't see anybody winning the race there. So I was like, I just got to stay in the group here. And then go back to conservation, which is what I did for the entire ride, or let's look at the entire race, 46% in active recovery. 13, though, at VO2 max or above. So it was windy and it was hot. And it's really hard to get away and do race winning moves in that. It was good. There was going to be an element of attrition, no doubt. You know, there were a couple surges. I made a couple moves. I tried to get away a few times. Um, the one thing that's not cool is people are still attacking through the feed zone. Now, my feed was very easy to grab, and I still had to burn a ton of matches one time. Um, right here. It was a two-minute effort, and, you know... I'm debating in my head right now, do I throw these guys into the bus? It was Mike's bikes. They did it both times. Chris laughed about it. Like, he was cool. But I want to say he was cool about it, but he was like, I had my bottles. I was good. That doesn't mean that you still attack. Like, people are trying to get water. That's part of the bike race. This isn't gravel where we're still wondering, do people wait? Do people go to the aid station? Gravel's different. You have to totally stop. This is a feed zone where, like, you should be able to chill for a minute. People can get bottles. And then the race resumes. I did have words with a guy that I respect, Barry Miller, who's an OG bike racer at Tonga last time. He attacked over these speed bumps through the feed zone full blast going into the last lap. I'm like, yo, dude, what you of all people know better than that. Like that is just so corny. Um, guys, we're not attacking through the feed zone. People did it at Amateur Nationals. You can guess what team it was there too. Like, I don't know why this is a trend. That's the, I don't know. Maybe we're not doing unwritten rules anymore. I'm not the one to make the rules. I do enjoy following rules. So that was always taught to me. Don't attack in the feed zone. Um, corny, for sure. I'm like getting worked up. Long climb two, 382. Very similar story. People did hit it much harder on that surge. And I think they were just, you know, hey, let's see if it cracks a couple people. I think it made this second portion much more difficult for those that just weren't able to handle the gas. And I mean, we went up to 600 watts for me, so probably like four or 450 for a smaller rider. And it was a 30 second zapper that if you're not doing over unders and you're not doing hard starts, you're not doing things like that in your training, you're going to have some fatigue in the legs. And then. People are going to hit you 
245 that time at 483. It was calm towards the end because we saw the group. It was like six of us maybe. Now the interesting thing is, and a big piece that uh, Giancarlo, I can't remember his last name. He was definitely one of the hitters. He got off the front on the first lap by himself. When he was riding away, I was like, this could not be good. I'm surprised he's doing this because he's a climber. He's a little dude. Maybe he's just in ridiculous fitness. And I was like, I'm just going to let him go. Let him go. Don't follow that, Brennan. That's a bad idea. We kept him within, it yo-yoed 40 seconds, 60 seconds, 40, 60. It was like a minute as we were going in the last climb. We caught him on that climb. A super steep climb like that, it is crazy. I mean, the guy... Guy had been out there for 20 miles, 30 miles by himself, you know, had to have been doing a decent effort. We weren't going that slow. Um, I mean, the whole race, we averaged 23, I want to say, 24 miles an hour. I mean, it wasn't flat. <laughs> it was definitely windy. So make it over the climb. We catch him. We're all together now. And I'm like, Sprint finish. I remember coming over that climb, coming down this road, and I was like, yo, dude, sprint finish. No one's going to beat you. You got this. These five guys and the guy that we caught, I'm pretty sure it was just six of us. Kip Taylor, I knew he hadn't been racing a ton, but he's a dude with the KOM. Chris Riker from Mike's Bikes, didn't know him too well, but was riding super well. Did not know this guy. And Jaden. Dude has an engine. I was trying to get away with Jaden on the last portion of the course. It just, when there's only six guys and, you know, we didn't really like, I should have said to him, like, let's get out of here together. Um, it was just such a small group. It was hard to make that communication and tried a couple moves here. But since this video is getting super long, I was just trying to bide my time, follow moves, make sure nothing got up the road following it looks dangerous and then coming into the finish the portion that you have all seen on video this is the turn to the final climb i put in a big dig up to a thousand watts i don't even know what this was it was 50 seconds at 567 you know we got separation from people, and Jaden was with me, and we just couldn't get it rolling on this downhill. So this is the finish right here. This is when you turn into the um, this is when you turn into the neighborhood. Now you guys all saw the video. What the video does not show is that it shows it, but it's so grainy. When we are coming down, well, so let me look at that. So it all comes together here. I take one more dig thinking maybe I could get away. I'm stuck on the front. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just set a tempo and I'm going to stay on the front. And so it was risky. And God, this felt like freaking 10 minutes. It was only 40 seconds. <laughs> it was only 40 seconds. But I'm riding like endurance tempo. No one's coming around me because we're going freaking how fast are we going? Averaging 35, maxed at 40. Like, we're rolling. We're moving. So people were all like, yo, let this chump go. But what they didn't know was I was about to attack into that corner. And so I gassed it, and it made me feel, feel really good. Shout out to Jaden. You were a super boss cyclist. And he said on Instagram, he's like, yo, dude, you went into that last corner with no fear. And I was just like, and I, I hit the brakes real quick at one point and, like, floated around the corner. And I made it around the corner and I was like, this is it. You got it. You're going to have to come around me at 55 miles an hour, which is not possible. I'm going to win this bike race. So I stomp, 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 stomp. And I look to go to the right. And I was like, they put up a barrier. Didn't even think about this, that it would be on the road at the white line. So you, so then the next thing is look to the left. What did we talk about? The broken pavement. The broken pavement looks sketchy at 30. I'm going over 40. So I'm like, well, I can't swerve to the left here. I'm just going to have to jump over it. So this is me airborne. This is where all the confusion in the video came from, all the chaos. 
I pointed this out to Chris because he showed me the video 800 times at the finish. And I was like, yo, dude, I jumped over the pavement. I don't know what you want me to do, but I'm not about to like drive my bike into broken pavement to possibly take us all out. I'm not going to swerve to the left immediately to go around it because I couldn't. You're, I'm sprinting into this thing. Like the finish line is right there. And he was just like, yo, man, I don't care if you jump. That's your problem to deal with. And I was like, not really, man. I'm in front of you. I'm jumping over a hazard in the road. I can't. It's on a turn. I can't turn an air, unfortunately. Like, I left my jet pilot pack at home. So when I land at 40, let's see here. Average 42, I max out at 46. This is me airborne. So that's why you see me stop pedaling. I land the bike, and I'm just like, am I landed? And I start sprinting again. I didn't jump into the comment section there. I appreciate the people that were like, dude, are you kidding me? It was an awkward end because, you know, I will say I wish he had just submitted his protest and like, that's what you do instead of trying to like drum up all this hubbub at the finish line and like get other riders involved. And I'm cool with you protesting. I'm cool with you getting any evidence that you can gather, but like he was kind of crap talking and I got a little heated up and I was like, yo dude, I'm standing right here, man. Like if you want to talk about this, let's talk about this, but put your protest in and then let's see what the judges have to say. You've given them like seven videos. The judges talked to him. They came and talked to me. It was such a little swerve from coming down from being airborne. Um, shout out to cycling tips for tagging him in the video that he submitted. It's just like continually stirring the pot. The race ends, dude. Get out the DMs. For whatever it's worth, I had heard things about this team. One of the other guys from Mike Spikes, I don't know him. He just rolled up and was like, yo, dude, good race. And I was like, hey, thanks, man. And he rolled on his way. So I know people had a lot of stuff to talk about. It's it deaded. It's over. If you get in a protest to everybody, um, don't lie. We never hit bikes. And when you tell me that you're coming past me five miles an hour faster, so you were going 51. If you're going 51, bro, you would have blown past me. So, yeah. Anyways, that's it. We won. And hopefully, the big things are everything was done beforehand. Check out the terrain, check out the altitude, check out how you're going to get to the race, check out your training up to the race. I really think that piece back there about like, when do you taper? How much taper do you need? Less is more, but you got to ride before a race and everybody figure out how to ride your bike through air. That will help you out. It'll eliminate a lot of chaos at the end. Congrats to my dude, Owen shot for winning. Uh, super proud of you, man. Uh, Craig, the other Evoke coach came out altitude and heat got the number on him. I think that was his first race in, in really that combo and coming from Buffalo, New York. Those are some things that we chat about post ride. Like dude is, uh, not seal, uh, Ranger trained, like don't mess with Craig <laughs> and, uh, the heat and the altitude will beat you up. And he was maybe out there just for the wrong duration, so I'm pumped if we go back to Albuquerque to see what he does. And, uh, man, who else? There were some other people that had some really great races, and I'm blanking on it right now. But congratulations to everybody. Um, nothing but love coming out of here at Evoke. This is not meant to stir the pot, but I definitely just had to say my piece. And um, appreciate the support coming up with the training. Shout out to everybody on Strava that's getting after it. I love that platform. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to a few more races this year. I'm looking forward to getting stronger. This is my last year in 35 plus. We're going to 40 plus, baby. Let's go. Let's get it. If you guys have questions about your training, if you need some help, we will help you for free. Um, We'll do a power file analysis, take a look at what you've been doing, where you're trying to go. Now's a good time to do it. I got a guy that was asked me even about like his wind down and shit. How does he like go into it's only the middle of August? He's got one more race. What does he do between now and then? The answer to him was a lot of questions back. Like, we got to know more about you. But man, we got a bunch of dudes that are willing to help you out for free. Uh, we don't even have a page to send you to, to sell you something for $19. Uh, some are like, that's Brendan, you need to sell more stuff. And I was like, 
I love pushing products that I use. Shout out Lactigo. Shout out Real Mushrooms. Shout out Hello Blue CBD. But I don't want to sell training stuff that I think is just knowledge that you can learn that you can do this. You can do this. Whoa, how did the cursor get so big? This is not out of the realm of possibility. This is, I don't even know how many years I've been training. This is a lot of years of training, but if you want to dedicate yourself, maybe it's something smaller. Maybe you want to win a state championship. Maybe you just want to win your local crit. Like you can be on a podium. You can become a better cyclist. Just put in a little bit of time. Start asking yourself questions. Start thinking about this. This is a thinking man's game. Woo! Got verbose, but hopefully this is helpful to you. Take care.